Wow. Oh, hey there. My name's Ross, and I'm a bit of a nerd for all things nature. So a while ago, I started a passion project called well, nerdy about nature. It began as social media videos sharing cool fun facts and tidbits of wisdom about the natural world and a sense evolved in this podcast that you're tuning into here. This project serves as means to inspire, educate, and engage folks with the outdoor world so that we can all become better stewards of it and so that we can all work together to create a more inclusive, diverse, equitable, and just future for each and every one of us in this world that we all share. Because nature, it's pretty dang neat, you know? I think we should keep it that way. So come on, let's go get nerdy about nature. Come and take a nature walk with me, we're gonna check out some really cool trees, we're gonna hang around and talk about all those things in nature that we can't live without, let's go get nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, baby, nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, come on, let's get nerdy about nature. Ah, what's up, nerds? Oof. God, what a beautiful day outside today, huh? It's a great day to spend outside amongst the plants and trees and everything green, maybe in the mountains, a forest, or maybe even in your own backyard garden. See, numerous studies have shown that spending time outdoors can help clear your mind, reduce stress and anxiety, lessen symptoms of depression, and generally improve your mood. Nature truly is the best medicine. So today's guest is Jordan Mara, who runs a little project called Mind and Soil, which aims to get people outside and into their gardens, not necessarily for food security or to become a full-time farmer per se, but instead to improve their mental health. Dirty hands clear the mind, so to speak, and by blending his own experiences with mental health issues, his philosophy behind gardening, and all the learnings along the way, he's crafted a very unique, very awesome, and very inspiring avenue for getting folks outside. I'm super excited for this one, and I think you're all really going to enjoy it. So today's episode is brought to you in part by Hoka and their brand new versatile hiker shoe, the Anna Kappa 2. Now the folks at Hoka were kind enough to send me a pair of these kicks a couple months ago and they've become my kind of go-to shoe whenever I'm heading out for a hike or just to romp in the woods with my boy Pincho, who's my big little 85 pound Mexican rescue pup. He's he's the best little adventure buddy. Uh, now these shoes have all the kind of standard high quality bits and bobs you'd expect these days from Vibram soles for good traction to a lightweight build and a Gore-Tex membrane, which helps keep the water out. But my favorite favorite part about them is the fact that they're made from all sorts of innovative and sustainably focused materials. You know, all the plastic parts here are all made from recycled sources. They've got a liner made from soybean oil and midsoles made from sugar cane, which is all pretty cool. Now, are they 100% perfectly sustainable? No, nothing in this world is perfect, but at least Hoka's trying to do the right thing here and building things for a better tomorrow. Now, I would still say that the best pair of hiking shoes out there are the ones that you already own, but if the ones you own are at the end of their lifespan and beyond repair and you're looking for a replacement, then take a gander at the Anacapa 2s. You won't be bummed. So come on and hang out with Jordan and I in his backyard garden in Squamish, BC, as we chat all about gardening, tricks, tips, and learnings along the way, the benefits it has to our physical and mental health, and how you can get started no matter where in the world you are. Um, have you listened to many? You said you listened to one yesterday? Uh, yeah, I listened to that one yesterday. Um, so something I've been doing, just to throw people on the spot, because people usually aren't too familiar with headphones, is just breaking it in for me with a nice little... Beatbox, Beatbox, whistle, yeah, yeah, tune, yeah, yeah. anything you want to do. For sure. Um, funnily enough, uh, there's been this like pigeon that shows up and just like hangs out on the house and it's used to be like a performance pigeon. Um, <laughs> so it's it's like bright pink and then like a blue tail and white. Um, so it looks like a like raver pigeon. <laughs> and That's a thing. Performance pigeons? Apparently. Yeah. yeah. And they get like released, but they don't know how to like live in the wild because they've been domesticated. Right. Um, and so it like comes and just hangs out on my roof. Um, but I call it like my little raver pride pigeon. And it went, it, it didn't show up for a couple of days, but then it came back over this way. And I realized that that one light on the back of my house there was like blinking. And it kind of looked like a little like disco. Right. And so I started like doing a little beatbox. I was like, tss, ah, tss, tss, ah, tss, tss, ah, tss. and the raver pigeon was, he was, he was diving. He was diving. <laughs> Is he a singer? Does, does the raver, raver pigeon sing? Did they sing? Um, no, uh, like, started to, yeah, yeah, like started to a little bit. I, I'm, I'm so curious, like what the background is on that pigeon because like it showed up and it like barely, like it would just like stand in the same place on the roof for like six hours. Mm. But then after like a week or so, it started like flying around more. It started singing a little mm -hmm. bit more and now I haven't seen it in like a week. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure where it's at. Yeah. Probably 
Well, I'm not going to be too pessimistic, <laughs> but <laughs> stop that right there. <laughs> a lot of house cats. <laughs> Don't say that about my cats. pigeon. <laughs> Um, okay, so welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Um, Jordan Mara is your last name, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you want to give us a little bit of an intro to who you are, what you do, and what we're talking about today? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I'm Jordan, and uh, I suppose I'm the founder at Mind and Soil, or it's the baby that I uh, founded two and a half years ago, um, which is kind of like a, the culmination of a, a big journey that I had been on just with kind of wanting to align myself with a little bit more impact and purpose. And um, ultimately, yeah, that culminated with launching Mind and Soil with the mission and intention um, to introduce a million individuals to gardening's mental health benefits, which uh, I think it's a really interesting one because a lot of people are getting into gardening and they're, you know, doing so because they want to know where their food's coming from or they want a more sustainable approach to their food or they want food security. Um, but very few people actually get into gardening from the perspective of, oh my gosh, this is so soothing and calming and peaceful and restorative. But what's really neat about it is that you ask any gardener that's been gardening for 25, 30 years, what one word they would use to describe what gardening means to them. And they'll say peaceful, calming, soothing, restorative. Um, and so that's the side of gardening that I really connected with originally. Um, and it's the side that I yeah, hope to kind of inspire and bring individuals into. Yeah. How did you get into gardening? Yeah. Uh, man, it was many years ago now so it was back in like 2012 2013 um and that's when i was going through my first big breakup in my life uh, and was in like just young heartbreak yeah 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 no 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 <laughs> <Tom>. yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, so yeah and i was i was just like super super anxious and went from being high performing at work to just like blankly staring at the computer screen was basically like not really sleeping at all unless I was kind of like boozing myself to sleep in the evening time and just in a really bad headspace. And so there was one and week. This ahead. is like early twenties. You're yeah. like, yeah, yeah. No yeah. coping strategies or mechanisms totally. worked out. You're just, yeah, yeah. Ex exactly. Yeah. Like I had done a little bit of like therapy when I was in university. Uh, and that was really cool because I was competing in track and field and athletics down in the States and we had a dedicated sports psychologist. So I was somewhat aware of this like therapy concept, but was wasn't something that I was like actively doing on a monthly or bi-weekly basis, anything along those lines. And so during that chapter, I ended up going out to my parents' place one weekend. They knew that I was in a really tough headspace and I went to sleep in the evening time, just like literally tossed and turned all night. And then, you know, kind of have that moment when you roll over and you see the windows starting to get a little bit lighter. And I'm like, well, here we go. Like another really rough day on, <laughs> on the docket here. <laughs> oh, God. So I go downstairs to make a cup of coffee. My mom, she comes around the corner. She said, George, you know, how'd you sleep last night? And I'm like, I didn't sleep. And she's like, you know what? Why don't we just go out to the garden for a little bit today? I was like, sure. So up until this point, hadn't done any gardening at all. We go out to the garden and she's just like, you know what? Like, let's just build a little bit of a raised bed over here to put some flowers into. And it's like nearly identical to the one that we're looking at across uh, over here. Uh, where she's like, we'll, we'll bring some compost in, we'll bring some yeah soil in, and then we'll bring some river rocks over as well to like build a little retaining wall. And that's all for the day. Like Perfect. Really clear instructions. Got it. So then start bringing over the wheelbarrows of the river rocks to set up that retaining wall. And then the you know wheelbarrows of the compost to fill it in before planting it up. And I still like to this day, 10 years later, so vividly remember walking along that path with the wheelbarrow in my hands and like feeling those clamps on my chest loosen for like the very first time where it's like when you're super anxious it's like you can't get a deep breath in and everything's like a little bit of like a short breath and just kind of like on edge and it was the first moment in that whole experience where i just like felt like i could take a deep breath and i was like oh like this is going to be okay and at that moment, I was like, I don't know what this like gardening thing is, but this is going to be like in my life for, for the rest of, of my days. And ever since then, I've just been like falling more and more in love with it each kind of each year since then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> Mental health stuff is that like breakups are so rough and sometimes you need something like that to kind of get you into it. What was like the initial, the initial thing that kind of kept you coming back to it? Like, how did you, did that become like a thing that you started doing like avidly all the time? Yeah, so 
it was probably more a couple of years later. I just realized that I was like, I, I really want to be spending time in the garden. But I was like living in an apartment in Vancouver at that time. So it wasn't really an option. And then I moved out to Australia for work. And it was super interesting because... What part of Oz? Uh, uh, Sydney. So Sydney. I, I ended up moving into like this Surrey Hills neighborhood. And I... At that moment, when I was thinking about like, okay, I'm moving across the world and I'm going to be getting a, you know, a place, what do I want to have in this place? And like top of the list was like gardening space. And so it was really at that moment that things like really started uh, just compounding, I suppose you could say, where gardening, like at that point, the garden space that I ended up getting at my place in Sydney was, you know, probably like two feet by four feet in length. It was really small, but at the end of every workday, every weekend, all that I wanted to do was like go and tend to like my tomato plants, the basil plants that I had in there. And then, you know, ultimately when I was leaving that place, I was like, I need more space in this. Like this isn't going to cut it. And so now ultimately, you know, seven years from then, I now have everything behind us, which is probably like 10 raised beds uh, and, you know, a whole bunch of flowing stuff and all the vegetables. But then I've also started introducing a lot more from like a floral perspective as well. Yeah. So it's really become like a cool ecosystem in, in this little area. Uh, but yeah, like from that moment, it just kind of like each year has grown a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. So it's kind of become like your routine. It's like your kind of self-care is just getting your hands dirty in the garden. A hundred percent. And there's like, like probably one of my favorite feelings is like having a really good solid day kind of feel like i've maximized that day and then spending like the last 30 minutes when like the sun's just starting to like dip behind the mountains literally just weeding and like listening to the birds the sounds the wind the river having the sun you know go back behind the mountains getting my hands into the soil and it's just such like a decompressing time you know when you think about what I would have been doing previously, I probably just would have like hopped onto like Netflix or been scrolling on Instagram. And so now it's, you know, spending that time out in the garden. And there's something just about that, that like switches my mind off of being in working mode and into just rest and relaxation mode. Yeah. I mean, and there are so many like quote unquote vices of the modern world that keep people from being connected to these to these places. I mean, even like I have a similar story, I'd say that I've never really like talked about, but like, yeah, I had a breakup that was horrible around like 2013. And I was actually, I moved to Australia. I was in Australia okay. and, uh, and I was like smoking ciggies, like rollies as you do. And just like the same thing, like <laughs> laying awake at night and watching the sunrise. <laughs> and you're like, yeah. oh God, it, here comes another here day. Here we go again. <laughs> yeah. Um, and for me, it wasn't the gardening aspect because I didn't really have any access to that down there. But just getting out and um, like I've always been like outdoorsy into mm -hmm. nature stuff. But I think like, you, you, big, know, you big nature guy? Big nature guy. <laughs> <laughs> kind of kind of get nerdy from time to time. But like I've always I've always had that. That's always been my thing. I'm very fortunate mm -hmm. to have been raised in a family that like we grew up like hiking and skiing and camping on the weekends and like getting out into it. And this is like before the era of cell phones. And I think it's like so easy to get wrapped up in the world of, of cell phones and the quote unquote social media that really just kind of alienates you and especially as like a, an influencer of yeah. sorts. It's so easy to get into that. But even, you know, back in twenty thirteen, fifteen 14, whenever this was like, uh, I found that like the biggest thing, like I had like a cheap cell phone plan. Like it was like, I can't remember the carrier, but it was like horrible service. So like, as soon as I left the city, I'd be like out of service. So then it's like, I would go on these like hikes like, oh, I'm just going to check out a waterfall. So I'd like hear about something and I'd like, you know, print off or download like a info page on how to get yeah. there and i'd do public transportation and ride my bike to the trailhead and be like <laughs> out of cell phone service and then like connecting to like a foreign environment i found was like really cool foreign to me like mm. i grew up in the in the northwest here so it's like i've always been around spruces and cedars and like all the kind of stuff that makes this bioregion so spectacular and I think I kind of took it for granted because I was just like, it's just the background, you know? Right. But then you're somewhere different. You're going through this, these hard emotional times. And then you find yourself like, I would be like, oh my God, like tree ferns. Like I've never seen a tree fern before, except in like dinosaur movies, you know, yeah. like you never see those in real life. And then you just get like enamored with this place that's, that's familiar, but still so different. And then you start like, then I started like asking questions and kind of like looking into that. And then when I came back up to, um, to Turtle Island, like this Cascadian bioregion, I just was like, oh, 
I like had this whole new appreciation for it because I understood how different things are around the world. Yeah. Um, but it was like that initial <laughs> draw of like having like, you know, feeling like so empty and needing something to fill you up in a way or something to be passionate and excited about. And like, I found that in like the natural world. And like, I really don't think there's any substitute for it. You know, like there's no, there's no substitute to getting out in the yeah. world. And I, I mean, like there's the whole like digitalization of everything happening right, right now. And I'm like, this is pretty damn good what we got here. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't need I, I, and and so I, it's interesting. I've been going more and more like less digital outside of what I'm doing work wise. Can't garden in the metaverse. No, totally. <laughs> and like, how could you beat this? Like, this is as good as it gets. It's such a yeah, like real and incredible experience. And I think you know, coming back to your experience in Australia, there, it really hits on many of the principles that I'm like a huge believer in which is called attention restoration theory and it, it's kind of this thing that i felt like intuitively was happening and then when i came across the concept attention restoration theory it connected like all the piece puzzle pieces for me so maybe what i'll try to do is explain it with the example that you just shared there yeah or yeah sure i was going to ask you about this anyway so continue for sure yeah so th this kind of like being in nature or being in gardening, it feels so good for some reason. And and so many people share this, that just when they step onto that trailhead or when they step into the garden, it feels really, really good. And I got so curious. I was like, what's going on? What, what's actually happening here? And as I was, you know, before even launching Mind and Soil, going along my journey of trying to figure out like, why is gardening so magical? I was reading up on nature-based therapy. And one of the like core principles of nature-based therapy is this theory, attention restoration theory that was kind of like published by Kaplan and Kaplan. And effectively, over the course of the week, we operate in different states of attention. And the big one that we operate in is directed attention. That's when we're at work, we're problem solving. You're focused. You're focused, you're figuring things out. You're utilizing directed attention. And that's like a gas tank where like over the course of a day or over the course of a week, that gas tank gets lower and lower and we start to feel like we're running on empty. When we feel like we're running on empty, we're more irritable, we're more stressed. We've got probably a bit of like a shorter fuse. And what's so interesting is that I think what's happened over the last 10 years is that, you know, we're on our laptop, our desktop over the course of the day, but then we get home and we're on an iPad, we're on a mobile phone. It's a very similar environment to where we were utilizing directed attention over the course of the day. So we haven't really stepped out of directed attention. And what we need to do is effectively like disconnect from that environment and from using direct attention and shift over into a different state of attention called attention restoration. And when we get into a state of attention restoration, all of a sudden we're not utilizing our direct attention and it begins to restore itself. It starts to fill back up. So the question then becomes like, how do I shift to being into a state of attention restoration? And there's four key principles to that. And this is where it kind of comes into your time in, in Australia. And so the first one is that you need to be away from where you were utilizing directed attention. So when we're sitting in front of that computer screen or when we're sitting on our phone on our couch, uh, we're in that state of direct attention. The moment that we step onto that trailhead or when we're in the middle of the forest or when we're in the garden, it looks and feels nothing like the place that we were utilizing directed attention. So our mind, our body, our nervous system begins to shift out of this problem solving, go, go, go mode into one of a more restoration, restorative mode. Then the next piece to that is that there needs to be a level of fascination. And so when you were mentioning when you're in Australia, you're like, none of those things that were back home grow here, but there's all these things that grow here. Why is that? How come they're able to thrive here and they wouldn't thrive back there? I think there was also a level of alertness because there's so many things that can kill you in Australia. So <laughs> yeah. I was like very keen of like, what is around this corner? Like, yeah. yeah. So I was like already actively engaged in looking around. Totally. Yeah. And that, that actually ties, I would 
argue even more into the third part of attention restoration, which is you need to be fully immersed in that environment. And so from a gardening perspective, you're fully immersed because you're, you know, earlier today, I was digging up weeds. My hands are there in the soil. I'm trellising tomatoes up to a piece of wood. I can't be texting. I can't be sending an email, anything along those lines. I'm fully immersed in my environment. For yourself, maybe you weren't necessarily digging things up, but you're alert and you're like what's around that corner there what's underneath that rock there what can i not see here and that immersion and that fascination results in our mind no longer ruminating and thinking about that thing whether it's the breakup whether it's what we're going through work-wise that was causing so much anxiety so much stress so much overwhelm and all of a sudden we feel more at peace we feel more restored we feel recharged and we're able to go back into those other parts of our lives with a full gas tank opposed to running on empty Mm mm-hmm yeah, and like you said, like overwhelm, like the overwhelm is so serious with a lot of those things. Like it, <clears throat> like people, I think there's a lot of terms that get thrown around a lot these days, um, you know, like overwhelm and trauma and stress and all these things. But like when you're really in a state of like severely being affected by something, like it, like overwhelm it almost doesn't do it justice. Like it takes over your life. It's like all your thinking about every think about. waking hour is sleeping like you don't sleep because of it and it keeps you awake and i think it's so this restoration attention mm-hmm. it's interesting too because it's a conscious thing you have to be awake for it it's not just like catching up on sleep that's like a whole different type of rest in order to like mm-hmm. fill that gas tank as you said yeah yeah absolutely and there's so many different ways that you're able to go about it, right? It doesn't need to be gardening. It could be hiking. It could be rock climbing. It could be mountain biking. The important part is that those three principles are there, that you're away from where you're stressed and overwhelmed or using directed attention, that you're like really fascinated by what it is that you're doing. So whether that's again, like rock climbing, you're thinking about the holds or mountain biking, you're thinking about the trail that you go down, skiing, et cetera. Um, and then it's a fully immersive experience. So effectively that you're not multitasking and like double dipping back into the area right. that you're utilizing directed attention. It's, it's finding flow state. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's like the exact word that I would use to describe how I feel when I'm gardening. You're just a hundred percent in flow. And I think that's like one of the big draws, especially as we sit here in Squamish, the outdoor recreational capital of Canada, self-proclaimed, I believe. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's fitting. <laughs> yeah. um, but like so many of these uh, outdoor sports, outdoor activities are so good because they kind of command you or demand you to be in flow state. Like you can't be thinking about what you're, how you're going to reply to that email when you're up on a rock wall totally. and like even if you're roped in, it feels like your life is literally being held on your fingertips. You know, like you have to be like there and now and in that, in that present moment. And I think that's something that's like not valued enough. And, and I, and to, to say that there's a caveat where I feel like people can also use that as like an escape to like avoid addressing a lot of like For those sure. issues or avoid like thinking about that thing. They'll just like fully dive into a sport and be kind of become kind of obsessed with it kind of like an addiction in a sense like that adrenaline addiction totally yeah i i think it's really all just boils down to conscious and intentional choices so i can go into the garden or i can go climbing or any of these things am i doing that from a perspective of refilling my tank so that i can get back to working through the things that i know that i need to work through in my life or am i doing that to run away from the things that i don't want to address in my life both things happen and occur uh but there's uh, you know a, a, a an important difference between right. the two yeah and i would almost to make like an amendment to those three because i don't think it's a maybe it's one under the fascination part but like it's so helpful having something new something like Mm. learning that you're doing Mm. um you mentioned like skiing as like a thing that you do kind of in flow state like from my experience like i have been fortunate enough to have skied like basically my entire life my dad had me on skis at two i hated it when i was a kid but then like as a teenager it like clicked when i was like oh like I'm, this is actually like can be really fun but now and like especially because then i got into like outdoor filmmaking stuff so i was like shooting a lot of ski movies and i kind of got um jaded because i'd be in like the most amazing places in the world perfect conditions bluebird like chesty pow and i'd have to sit at the bottom and like watch people film it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm just like all right <laughs> you should probably land that because i'm gonna be really mad if you yeah. don't um <laughs> It, it kind of it like wore on me so then i'd be like skiing and like something that i have loved my entire life and like been into but it just became routine where i wasn't like i could think about how i was going to reply to an email while going down some like relatively dicey line and i was no longer like right in the moment with it 
but then trying something new like snowboarding it like it commands you again to like put all your focus there because if you don't you're gonna fall you're gonna get hurt you're like yeah so having that like that learning curve i think is a really fun place to be like too often we like plateau at all these things whether it be you know, whether it be like a, a, an adventure skill like that or work, maybe your career, like you've been doing it for so long that it becomes stagnant. Um, yeah, I think there's like a lot to be said about like switching things up, like every kind of five it's, to 10 years in your life, like yeah, finding it, something new and diving into it. Totally. It's, it's so interesting that you mentioned that because I, I hadn't thought about that like through the lens of attention restoration theory, but doing something new in some ways, like it's a bit of like a cheat code in some ways because you're progressing so quickly early on and as you get those early progressions you get that dopamine release of just like oh dang i couldn't do that yesterday and i just did it and you know obviously like the the more that you apply yourself to a certain thing those become fewer and far in between where it feels more like you know the the number of hours of work that you have to do in order to land whichever trick becomes very significant versus at the very beginning it's like oh my gosh i made it down that blue run that was unreal and then the next day like you're doing a black run for the first time and that feels amazing and in those instances where you're especially you know in a more challenging headspace getting those dopamine releases and things that feel good is uh just really really powerful and really encouraging or, or, or helpful, especially when the other areas in life aren't really providing that to you. Well, and it like diversifies your, um, your skill set in a, in a sense, like not necessarily like the physical skills, but like the like emotional capability skills. Like, you know, if you're like constantly challenging yourself, you become more confident when you're able to overcome those challenges and you'll be able to like do different things, whether it be like a physical challenge or like a mental thing or like writing an essay, researching things. Like there's so many different ways you can like challenge yourself. Um, yeah, I think Yvonne Chouinard, uh, have you read Let My People Go Surfing? I want to say I, I read it back in the day or listened to it as as an audio book. Great book. Yeah. yeah. I think I've read that. Oh, it's been a while, but I've, I've read it like three or four times, but a while ago. But he has this concept talking about being like an 80 percenter. And it's like, and then there's this idea of like that, you know, you spend 10,000 hours at doing anything, you're going to become a master of it. And it's kind of along those lines where it's like, yeah. If you're spending 10,000 hours doing something, you're going to become a master at it. But like, it's almost to a level, like if you have, you've got a hundred percent efficiency or like mastery of a thing, that's kind of psychopathic. You yeah, know? It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you're kind of obsessed. It's kind of like a weird place to get to versus like, if you're if kind of like you've reached like 80% mastery of like any given thing it is, it's like you, you still get to like experience the fun rush of that learning curve. You're still like enjoying what you're doing, but you're not. Oh, hey, little thrushes. Hey, yeah. um, you're not getting like so overwhelmed or obsessed to the point when like the fun gets removed from it to become a perfectionist. You're still like able to like, you can get down most things, you can do most of it, but you're not going to be like as proficient as it as you could be if you were like totally insanely mastered. Yeah, to totally. It's, you know, I, I certainly feel and experience it in gardening in some regards where I'm like, why can I just figure this thing out when you that picture that I showed you of like the harvest that I got yesterday, you know, there, there's many moments throughout the gardening scenes where I'm like, I suck at gardening. And then I like realized yesterday as I harvest this beautiful basket of goods from the garden near the beginning of July, it's like, oh wow, that's a lot of amazing stuff. And from so many different plants that I harvested in one sitting that there's no way I would have been able to do that many years ago. So you kind of lose perspective a little bit, the deeper that you go down, you know, kind of, mastering a certain craft and and gardening in itself is so cool because it's um you like like everything kind of in in our world today it's like people want to know it's like you want to have not necessarily expectations but like you want to know how much yield you're going to get you know for like farmers and stuff and then like you think it's going to be this like mathematical equation, but you're still working within this wiggly realm of nature where it's like soils are different. Things happen. Seasons are weird. Like you're kind of like working in this like flow of things as they change and evolve within these systems. And you can't necessarily have like consistent outcomes. A hundred percent. That's like one of the biggest things that I preach is to replace your expectations with experimentation. And the reason why is because if an individual is getting into gardening for the first time and they saw a huge harvest basket on somebody's Instagram account, and they're like, I want that. Well, they could do everything perfectly, but then 
Mother Nature could throw a really cold spring your way, a really hot spring your way, uh, all kinds of different variables that are outside of your control. So if your happiness and essentially what you're deeming success in the garden is tied to the bounty, the harvest, the yield, well, a lot of that's actually out of your control. But what is within your control is experimentation. So I'm going to set this zucchini up one way, and then this one over here, I'm going to set it up differently. Maybe I'm going to prune all the early flowers off of one, and I'm not going to prune it off the other so that all the energy can just go into foliage development for the first 60 days and see if then by it having a larger canopy, it's going to ultimately yield more zucchinis, more squashes, whatever it might be. Now, at the end of that season, you've got a finding, a learning that you're going to be able to apply into all of those, you know, zucchinis that you're growing for the next year. So it's kind of up, like, like upskilling or, or leveling up as a gardener while simultaneously releasing any of the expectation of like, oh, I need to get 30 zucchinis this year. To be successful. To be successful. Unquote. Exactly. Right. And when you then compound that over three, four, five years, you become a really incredible gardener. But coming back to the dopamine piece, what what is not guaranteed when the expectation is, oh, I want 30 uh, zucchinis is whether or not you accomplish that. But when what your expectation is, is that, hey, I'm going to run this experiment and I'm going to try and see what the difference is between the two of these. Pretty much every single time you get a learning from that. And so you get that dopamine release of like, oh, I know how to grow this a little bit better. I can't wait to apply those learnings next gardening season. So now it pulls you back in because you're like, I've got this amazing little nugget of information yeah. that I can apply into my, next, exactly, yeah. into my next gardening season. And so that's like a huge thing that I preach to people to help them connect with that more restorative and mental health side of gardening and to let the you know harvest the bounty the yield let it be what it what it's going to be that's that's a byproduct of spending time in the garden and and, and going about it from an experimental perspective mm -hmm. yeah it's like letting go of the attachments to like what you think you want like everybody is looking at especially like like you mentioned you see the the big bounty on instagram there are so many things that we're kind of like subconsciously taught to like want to achieve in order to be a quote unquote success well that's like how perfect your bread loaf is you know during covid and everybody's like i just got to get this loaf looking great for a photo but it's like how about you focus on the taste the texture the process you know like all these different things like that's where the growth is that's where the learning is that's where you find that that flow state a hundred percent and the way that i view growth really in all areas of my life is effectively just cycles gr growth equals cycles multiplied by kaizen so let's take because i do tons of videos like and, short and videos. kaizen is that the japanese term of like cons consistent improvement with yep. each iteration yeah exactly one percent improvement each iteration, each cycle. So let's use short form video content because that's you know something I do tons of with Mind and Soil. When I publish a video, that's a cycle, a repetition. When I watch that video back, I can try and find one thing that I could do a little bit better, whether it was a particular shot, whether it was the talk track, whether it was the topic. Okay, I'm gonna now take that learning and we'll apply it into the next video. And we keep on operating in that manner. Do a cycle, find an improvement, do a cycle, find an improvement. All of a sudden, things really start growing and taking off for you. And that's the exact same model with gardening from an experimental perspective. Pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna grow beets and carrots in one soil versus another. And I'm gonna get a learning from that. I'm gonna apply that learning into the next round that I plant. And then after three, four years, I'll probably be really successful at growing that particular plant. So I don't know that 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 approach to growth for me has just applied in a lot of different areas of of life. And so when you started Mind and Soil, that was kind of the beginning of the pandemic, mm -hmm. which is a great time because like people were like stuck at home if they're fortunate enough to have a garden and just get into gardening and then tying in the mental health elements mm -hmm. of that because mental health struggles have been like a light has been shined on them through the pandemic. So. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about how you got into this project. Yeah, absolutely. So I suppose even going a couple of years earlier than that, when I was living in Australia there and I prioritized having garden space for the very first time, one thing that I quickly learned when I was in Australia is that there's no composting system out there. So there's no like municipal composting where you can put in, your... In Sydney back in, Sydney. in the day? In yeah. 2015? 2016. 2016. 2016, yeah. 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 And I'm not sure if they, they have it now. So effectively, like if I had eggshells and coffee grounds and, you know, leafy greens 
rather than putting those into the composting, I had to just put those into like my rubbish bin that would go to the landfill. And I hated that. I was like, this is ridiculous. This is amazing stuff that could go back into the garden as compost. And you tell me it's just going to be like sitting in a bag somewhere in a landfill. And I started thinking through like, okay, how can I actually go about composting in a small like loft apartment and YouTube, which I absolutely love. I just started researching, you know, composting in small spaces. And what kept on coming back was worm farming and basically buying like 1500 worms, having them in this little farm or little bin, and then feeding your kitchen waste, your scraps to them they eat it up, they poop out a worm casting, and that ends up being really amazing fertilizer for your garden. So it's effectively compost, but it's passed through the digestive tract of a worm. And as it passes through that digestive tract, rather than just like breaking down over time, it's breaking down with the bacteria, the enzymes, the microbes that are on that digestive tract of the worm. And those just happen to be like miraculously amazing for plants. So it's like this supercharged natural organic fertilizer. Interesting. So I started playing around with that. I bought 1,500 worms. I set up a worm farm in my loft in Sydney, yeah. Australia, and I totally fell in love with it. I was like, this is the most amazing thing. And so, then, a worm cast is just a fancy way of saying worm poop. Worm poop. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I can... Uh, Why I, are they I, called I, a cast? Is it... I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. I Castings. imagine it coming out. I imagine it being, I don't know, like a hard... I'll, I'll, I'll give some to you uh, afterwards. You can <laughs> okay, take sweet. on your way. <laughs> you said you have some worm poop. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. <laughs> And so the, the reason why I bring that up is because then fast forward to when the pandemic was happening and I was wanting to move more towards an area of impact for me, that being in the mental health space and sphere, a lot of that due to like what my original kind of like relationship with gardening came from. And I started like realizing like I, I just love gardening so much. I want to be spending all of my time on this possible. And so I started posting every Saturday what I called Soil Saturday. And it was just like whatever gardening project that I was working on. And as I shared these, people were like, oh my gosh, I love these stories, these videos that you're putting together. And then I started looking up anytime that gardening was mentioned alongside stress, anxiety, PTSD, grief, and all these Google alerts were coming back to me with studies, anecdotes, research being done on how powerful gardening and nature is for our mental health and well-being. So then I started like layering those into these soil Saturdays that I do. It'd start with one kind of like quick little, kind of like a fun fact on how gardening is so good for your mental health. And then I'd go into the garden project. And then what I did was I shared a basically experiment of when I started seeds in just a sterile store-bought miracle Grow peat moss mix versus when I then added my worm castings to it. And when I added the worm castings to it, which again, is just like amazing natural and organic fertilizer, they started growing like five to six times larger. And so people started messaging me being like, how do I get my hands on some worm castings? I want some of that stuff. And it was like at that moment that I had like the, I think the Japanese concept is uh, uh, ikigai, where it's like what you love to do, what you're good at, what the world needs and what you can get paid for, where I kind of, it, it kind of all came together for me where I was like, I want to help introduce individual to into individuals to gardening's mental health benefits. And I believe that I can do that through basically selling worm castings for people to be utilizing in their gardens. And so that was enough like validation for me to then decide to wrap up everything I was doing work-wise. Uh, I took like $51,300 of my own personal savings. And I was like, I'm just going to give myself 12 months of runway because I'm like, I can feel my soul like totally on fire that I want to bring this into the world. And I've got no idea where things will go or, or what will happen from here. But I just wanted to like be able to dedicate all my time and energy towards beginning, beginning to build this thing, which has now become mind and soil. And, uh, yeah, been, been doing that since <laughs> it's a great, like learning curve through the pandemic too. And people have been receptive. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's been amazing. And it's like, it's just been that entrepreneurial journey where what I originally started with was worm castings. And then if you're trying to be doing this as you're living, you need to be making money and paying all the bills. And so I was like, okay, I'll do other physical products. But then I started to see that for myself, just personally, like this isn't a right or wrong thing. I was like, I can see where this path goes. I just need to keep on like buying more products and like expanding the product line. And I didn't like the idea of just 
sourcing as many products as possible and having them shipped all over the world to me and then shipping them out to people i was like i only want to sell people the things that i like legitimately use in my garden but that might not be big enough to build out a, a business that sustains me and so that's when i started really going down the content path because i was like i need to be educating people right like it's doesn't really mean anything if they have a bag of worm castings they don't know how to utilize it and so i started doing more and more video content and that's been the part of i guess mine and soil that's really taken off and become like the biggest focal point at this point so there's yeah there's now like just over six hundred thousand subscribers and followers across the platforms and yeah, the last last couple months has been like over 10 million views on the video content uh, that I put out that are just, yeah, different, you know, gardening tips and, and tricks to help people be getting their hands dirty. Yeah, I, I love that aspect because like it's it's globalization in one sense, like you're talking about like the globalization from like a manufacturing producing capitalism kind of selling yep. selling shit that people don't need exactly um versus like the globalization where it's like quote unquote where you can connect with anybody all over the world and kind of build these communities based on shared values regardless of where you are like that's such a powerful thing that like the internet has allowed for people it's amazing and, and i think too often we just get caught up in that like that capitalist mentality of like trying to sell things and push product as good as the product is it's like we're really at a state in this kind of like late stage capitalism thing where it's like we don't need new things no like we, no. we need nothing new if anything we need to like learn Less, yeah how to use what we have and better you know well, to totally and, and when you think about the educational side of gardening ultimately what that results in is an educated gardener that is able to consume less, right? They don't need tomatoes being shipped to them from the other part of the world. They don't need all of these gardening products and tools and all of those things. They're able to do a lot of that in their backyard. And my, I guess my, one of my like big personal beliefs and philosophies is that like we need to decrease our consumption. And so that education, I believe is helping with that because there isn't all this need to be buying this, that, and the other when you are now educated and know how to do that on your own and in your backyard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, tell me a little bit about the the studies that you read up about like mental health and gardening. Yeah, yeah. This was a lot of, again, like it's kind of like feeling things. I, I, I knew how good I felt when I got out of the garden. So I was like, there's got to be something going on here, but I need somebody to like do the research or to, to, to do it in, a, in a, a more structured manner than just me being like, it feels great. And one of the results that came back from that Google search where I had anytime that Google is mentioned alongside anxiety, stress, PTSD, grief, etc., was this study by the Royal Horticultural Society over in the UK that they did in conjunction. I believe it was with the University of Sussex, uh, but I'd have to double check which university they partnered up with it. And effectively what they wanted to see was like, what impact does gardening have on an individual's cortisol levels? So their stress levels. And so they, you know, basically developed like, or like they, they put together their cohort of individuals that were going to be in the study and they measured their cortisol levels at the beginning of the study. And only 24% of the individuals had healthy cortisol levels. So in other words, 76% of the individuals were stressed out at just like their like natural operating state. And what they then did was they basically set a portion or like, like half of the individuals up with the gardening supplies to get into gardening over the course of the year. And a year later, they did the next round of that study measuring uh, the, the cortisol levels a year later, and that number had climbed from 24% up to 53%. And so it was like, okay, this is clearly at like the chemical level having a positive impact on individuals. And so it was another one of these just like moments of like, right, I know that I can feel these things that are happening in me, and this is what's actually happening beneath the surface or within us. Right. And that's because cortisol levels are linked to like high blood pressure, linked to heart failure, all sorts of like physical things inside you. But then there's also the element of like playing in the dirt and like, especially for children, like getting exposed to like all these different microbes and things in the soil, like increases your immune system yeah. like capacity. So like, there's two super interesting things on this front. Uh, one of them is that there is a soil bacteria called uh, Mycobacterium vaccae, V-A-C-C-A-E, and it's basically being studied now as a natural and organic antidepressant, where as you're interacting with it, like the properties that it holds results in 
you know, yeah, they're, they're, they're looking at ways to utilize it now as a, a natural antidepressant and you're interacting with it when you're gardening without gloves on and like getting your hands right there into the soil. And is it in like basically all soils or I, there's probably like areas yeah. where there's higher pro yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure on what essentially like micro, uh, environment needs to be available for it to be found. Um, and whether that's like, you know, a, an environment that's really high in organic matter, like compost, or if you'd be able to find it in something like the forest, like what properties need to be present in order for it to be present. But that'd be, that'd be interesting to look into more. And then the second piece that's like, again, more down like the, just like pure anecdotal path is I obviously spent a ton of time in the garden and since launching mind and soil, which is back in 2020, I haven't had like a single day where I've been sick, where I've missed a day with like a cold or a flu or anything along Ooh. those lines. And, you, and this is through the pandemic, you're skirting in conspiracy theory. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, no, yeah, yeah, no, I'm not going down that path at all. Yeah. All I'm saying is that like it, it's it's so interesting to me, like how much time I spend and and everything that's in my garden is just like compost, natural and organic materials. So there's an incredible amount of biology that is in that soil. And the amount that I'm interacting with all those microbes is probably like a couple hours every day. And I've got no idea like what impact that's having on me. But what I do know is that like I've been incredibly healthy for the last yeah. many, many years, which is pretty neat. <clears throat> well, and I think that's like an interesting... An interesting thing to consider from like this kind of classical Western science perspective is like we so often compartmentalize things and it really is kind of beyond our grasp of understanding. Like it is this holistic picture. It's like working in the soil, sure, it gives you like microbes and exposes you to that, but it's better for your mental health. Like your cortisol levels are down. Like there's all these different factors that contribute to like an overall better, healthy picture. It's not just like how much vitamin C you're taking. Like if you're stressed out beyond belief and you're not getting any sleep, but you're taking a ton of vitamin C, like your your immune system isn't going to react. Like it's it's this holistic picture about like how your life is shaping to create like a healthy totally. immune system. Yeah, yeah, and that's you know w when I started mind and soil, I was really focused on the mental health side, and as it's grown so much, what I'm starting to feel come up in in me is that gardening is just a really healthy activity. It's really healthy for your mental health. It's really good for your physical health. And it's really good for the planet's health. And so it's, 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 it's beyond even just the mental health side. It's, it's these many different pieces that just make it like an incredibly, incredibly healthy activity to be taking part in. Have you heard of the concept of grounding? Yep. Yeah. Do you know much about that? Uh, a little bit, but fill me in. I, I don't know. Okay. I, I, like, I, I was just curious. It's something that I've like I've I've heard of. I don't know much about it. Um, my kind of first impressions, like I haven't read anything about. It. I've just kind of like seen a couple things on the internet. So whoever, if there's people out there who are like yeah. scientists on it, my understanding of it is that like um, us living things, just like everything, like we're conductors for static electricity, mm -hmm. and we have you know phones and electronics around us at all times. So we're always kind of insulated from the real world. We're you know, rubber shoes, and we don't really yeah. get into a state where we're like touching or interacting with the planet in a way. Right. Like we don't have that mm -hmm. grounding thing that removes that mm -hmm. kind of static electricity from us. And yeah. by having more connection to the to dirt and earth, and like walking around barefoot on like the soil, you reduce. I don't know. It's I've heard studies where they've um, been able to like reduce like inflammation and in, right like joints and stuff and and throughout your body like just by having this like connection just by like like seriously like walking in the dirt ten minutes a day yeah thing, barefooted to totally yeah yeah and I I've, I've definitely heard the the concept and the value of it and I think for me it it, it the underlying theme is that it's really good for us to be disconnecting from being so plugged in, so connected and reconnect with things that are more natural, such as getting our hands into the soil, such as getting our feet onto the ground, whether that's the grass, the dirt, etc. Whether that's going for a cold plunge and like fully immersing yourself in that environment. Uh, I think those are you know probably three different examples of like, like maybe one of them is, is grounding, but the common theme amongst those three is that it, there, there's, there's no overlap. There's no multitasking. It's being fully present in a natural environment that 
I think our nervous systems are really craving and, and, and really looking for just with how overstimulated the digital world kind of is and, and, and has become. Mm-hmm. Not, not even just the digital world, like the world entirely. Yeah. And this kind of goes back to like the shortcomings of, of Western science is like that compartmentalization. It's like we need this like you need to have connection in all these different ways. Um, one of my favorite games to play, um, it's especially fun in like airports and stuff, but if you go somewhere, like anywhere in this modern world, like technology aside, it's like find the natural substrate. Okay. And you just like look around where you are, like a mall and like an airport, like there's, and you're just like, you're like, okay, I'm going to find a piece of wood. I'm going to find like some rock. And it's like, it's nothing. It's like all metal or like plastic or these resins that like yeah. things that keep us from being connected in any way. Like even just a visual sense, it's like, there's no sign of what existed in any of these like landscapes or developed areas prior to that development. You're just like, oh, this is a city street and it's always been like this, but it's like, no, like there's soil beneath those, that concrete that like pre previously hosted these massive beautiful old growth forests but we're uh-huh. just so disconnected yeah 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 it's it's always a little frightening when you see the pictures of say like vancouver in like 1915 and then you see it now and you're like you can't even recognize the two of them because everything's just been like flattened and removed um and, and coming back to the yeah the the example of of going to the airport and finding those natural pieces w- and, and from a grounding perspective, there's many things that we can be doing to kind of, again, introduce like a little bit more grounding or a little bit more mindfulness into the way that we're interacting with our different environments. And so say with the garden, you know, there's a lot of times where I feel myself working away on my laptop inside and I'm like, I want to go spend some time in the garden. And I step into it and I like go straight into like pruning this, trellising that, all these different things. And I haven't like really stepped out of that energy of the just like, go, go, go. And the way that you can step out of that is through grounding, through mindfulness. And so like one of my absolute favorite things to do is when I sit down in the garden, just on those steps right there, I'll close my eyes for two to three minutes. I'll just take deep breaths and I'll try to listen to and count as many unique sounds as I can. And it starts with like maybe something happening in the kitchen right behind me or the kids playing across the street or the lawnmower that I can hear right now yeah. running a couple <laughs> uh, doors over. But then you start to hear the river just a couple blocks away. You start to hear the wind moving through the trees. You start to hear the wind moving through the different types of trees and the way that those leaves are moving. And they start hearing the birds chirping. Maybe you hear a hummingbird buzzing. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, like the amount of life that I'm surrounded by right here. And that thing that I was working on two minutes ago now feels like it was two hours ago just by being really intentional with how I'm stepping out of that go, go, go energy and more into that rest relaxation mode. Mm-hmm. Becoming like present with your location. Yeah. You've got some great trees here for sounds too. I noted you have you had a little ginkgo growing here. I do. Ginkgos have a beautiful sound in the breeze. Yeah. They kind of, they, all their leaves are kind of in these little clusters. It's yeah. really like a... Not necessarily papery, but like a, was, that, that, that's the word yeah. I was going to use. I was going to say they're more like papery, yeah, um, versus, versus like a needle, totally, yeah, yeah. And, and kind of float around a little bit, a little bit better. Um, you want to tell me a little bit about your garden here? Let's kind of move into the garden a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to use my phone to take some video for of what, sure. whatever you're pointing out, so I can uh, yeah. splice that over. So I think the most important part to note that I shared earlier is how much I believe in experimentation because that allows us to really have like everything within our control. And so almost everything that you'd see behind is some form of an experiment. So take these three first beds here. Right. So you're not just like having these to like maximize your crop and grow as much as you're playing. Exactly. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Like, like the way that I garden is not efficient at all from a like yield maximization perspective because what I'm trying to maximize is the amount of like learnings, the amount of experimentation that I can do. And so these three beds here, when we take a look at it, we've got garlic right at the very front here and there's garlic in each three of them. And then we can just see the lettuce starting to come up right behind it. And then you got the beets right behind that. You got carrots right behind that, peppers right behind that, potatoes, and then tomatoes at the very end that are trellised up the, the trellis there. So these three beds are the exact same, except for one variable. Exact same composition of plants. Yes. 
and completely different composition of soil. So I filled these three beds with three completely different soils. So this first one here is 100% compost, and that's like your very restorative, regenerative, right. no dig, no till environment. Lots then, of organic matter. Yep, yeah, tons, tons of organic matter. The second one is 75% compost and 25% vermiculite, which is a clay particle that's been heated up, so it's really good from a, a water a water absorption perspective and then the third bed i basically took uh six inches of compost and then rototilled that into six inches of the native soil to get a kind of just like natural environment for what i'd have in my backyard and then planted the exact same things in these three and then what i do over the course of the year like next week i'll be harvesting out all of this garlic i'll let it cure for two weeks and then i'll wait each of the basically like amounts of garlic from each of the beds to find out which one did it grow best in. And so you're kind of a bit of an, a bit of a scientist here, bit, bit of a nerd, you might say, <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if I do, if I do say so myself <laughs> from my initial observations here, it looks like the uh, organic matter here of the compost is it's all right. Yeah. Um, same when you mix it with the, the clay particles, maybe a little bit better. You said better water absorption because the clay would absorb the Correct. water, but the native soil yeah, wow, look at those carrots. That's like the, they're, are those beets next to them? Yeah, beets yeah. next to them. And and they're what's just so firing right now? Yeah, what's so interesting is that the 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 middle bed, the seventy five percent compost, twenty five percent vermiculite, it grew. Everything grew about like thirty to forty percent bigger last year in that one. But now this year, the one with the native soil that you know you can make the argument has had now a year to establish. Because when I went through there and set that bed up last year, that was with a rototiller that absolutely ripped everything to shreds that would have been in that soil. But now it's had a year of growing, not being disturbed, and things are growing like incredibly well in that bed. And I could like you know. I, I kind of already know that that bed it looks like will be the winner just based on where things are at and they're going to continue to progress at the same rate so those ones are going to continue to be the leaders amongst this this group and that's for me that's that's amazing right because now right this bed was the best last year 75 percent compost 25 percent vermiculite but now if you're telling me that i can grow even better without having to buy that vermiculite so it doesn't have to be mined it doesn't have to be processed all that I need is the native soil and wherever it is that I'm gardening and adding compost to it. That's that's a win. That's a huge win. Right. Oh God. Yeah. The, the nerd in me wants to know so much more. Have, are you testing like acidity in these soil beds? And, so and yeah. like because then there's like microbes. There's like fungi. Like, oh, like there's yes. probably way more fungal connections in the native soil than you would in any of the store bought stuff. Because especially the vermiculite would have been baked out and like yeah. relatively yeah. void of any totally other sterile. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. Totally sterile. And so so yeah, you you, you would be able to make the argument that it would also be really high in the 100% compost bed. However, to your point, like where this experiment should go next is doing a soil analysis at the end of the season to get a bit of an understanding where all the macronutrients are at, where all the micronutrients are at, what's happening with the electronic, uh, electric connectivity, what's happening with the pH, and then making those adjustments with specific natural and organic amendments so rather than and so this is where like rather than just having compost you could have more of like a high nitrogen compost or you could have more of like a rooted crop compost and what you're putting into that compost would be then the you know like the uh different inputs that'd be higher in nitrogen or higher in potassium higher in phosphorus and you have them separate and then you apply those based on what it is that you're trying to grow in those gardens so that would be like where this experiment could go next in order to try and yeah, like take it to an even even higher level even nerdier even nerdier level, level. Yeah. yeah totally and where did you get the the native soil from is that just from your yard here yeah from the yard here yeah so and that's like that's a really cool thing because you know for myself that that effectively would have been the backfill that was brought in for the house that's been here for now 45 years but if you were to go to say Brew Creek, they're in the middle of the forest and their Which soil- Which is a coastal Douglas fir yeah. forest up there. Yeah. And their soil, it at, 
it, or no, it, sorry, it's it's a Western Hemlock. Sorry, I'm getting you, you tell me, yeah, it's a coastal Western <laughs> Hemlock zone, but I'm, it's dominated by Douglas firs up there, got gotcha. altitude. Yeah. Okay, and uh, their their soil when we did the like analysis on it last year, it was like 97% clay, so it's like really really high in clay. Really great from a moisture retention perspective, but really difficult for roots to grow through. So the amount of compost that was needed to like amend that, break it down, the amount of cover cropping that needed to be do done, it really took like you know, two, three years before you'd see beds getting really, really strong in an environment like that. But then at that point in time, you've got all this beautiful clay in the soil that's going to be able to hold on to the moisture and you've got all the organic material that's broken down in there. So you've got this incredible growing medium at that point in time. It just takes time to, to get there. Yeah. And I think it's important to note too, that like how different every part of the world is. Like we're in a yeah. really unique part here with like all the glaciations happened in the last or since the last, like, I mean, a long time but like the recent recession of the glaciers like 10,000 years ago like and all these fluvial processes in these riverbeds that have like created all that that silt and clay like build up um it's really unique and and at the same time like life is relatively <laughs> life plant life is relatively new here like these forests have only kind of really been existing for 10,000 years since that glacial retreat um versus somewhere in like the south or like eastern part of turtle island like mm -hmm. you have these forest systems that are like have been existing for much longer so you get like much deeper richer soils mm -hmm. generally yeah but then there's like a whole different like the ph levels are different yeah. nutrient levels are different like everything's just so radically different Everywhere where you are totally and especially with gardening there's a lot of like i i'm not super in i i would love to be into gardening more but i just haven't had the opportunity i'm like renting places don't yeah. want to like invest in somebody else's yard um but there's like zones and stuff like all the different zone types of, yeah, and yeah soil types like um yeah the, yeah oh, sorry sorry yeah in terms of growing zones yeah so so you know, say up at brew creek 30 minutes up the road they are considered zone five and it's only 30 minutes away from here. And here I'm zone 7B. And the only difference with that, though, is just because they're at a higher elevation. And so depending on where you are across North America or the world, for that matter, you're going to be in a different growing zone. And that's going to inform when you start certain crops, when you plant them out, when you direct sow, and kind of like what you'd be able to grow kind of how late into the year and potentially over the winter time. And are those zones based mostly on like geography and climate as opposed to soil types? And Correct. Stuff? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it wouldn't have anything to do with the, the soil type. So you could go over to like Maine, New Hampshire, and there, I think there are zone seven as well. Okay. Uh, but, so it's uh, like when median temperatures warm up, how long days are. Exactly. Yeah, yeah ex exactly. And, and, and then every growing environment is going to be totally unique. And so mm -hmm. there, I, I suppose for like the, the, the new gardener that can feel really overwhelming because it's like, Oh my gosh, like I need to know like what zone I'm in, what my soil, like my native soils, like what kind of compost I should be amending into that based on the crops that I'm, it's like, you don't need to make it that complex. You can just like grab uh, and, and build a, potting mix yourself or a soil yourself with things that you'd be able to find at a nursery or a garden center. And then if you want to go deeper and nerdier down that path and start really understanding what's happening within the soil from both like a nutrient and microbial and bio biological level, then that's like that's kind of the beauty of gardening is that that's a never ending game and you're going to be learning things for 20, 30, 40 years on that front. So I, I just share that to kind of, I, I suppose, preface that it can be as complex as you need and it can be as simple as you need. And that's where say with these three garden beds, I haven't done those like next advanced really understanding what's going on in the soil, getting it under the microscope, getting it sent off to a lab, purely because there's still so much educating that I can do and that I want to do on helping people get into like gardening for the very first time. And and that would be like kind of like your gardening, like 401 university level class versus what I'm focusing on with uh, my content and, and what I'm trying to help people with is like gardening 101. Right. Yeah. So it's all just different levels along that, that learning curve. Totally, totally. But like uh, say Emily who works at Brew Creek, she can go a gazillion miles deep on the soil and all the biology and how you're effectively trying to create these environments within the soil for particular plants to be growing to their fullest potential and having different compost inputs 
and different compost piles that you then pull from based on what those crops are that are going in, which is like, again, that, that side of me, that's the side like I love so much. But then at the same time, I'm like, I don't have the bandwidth right now to be like fully like immersing myself in that um, because it, I don't believe that that's the, the right entry point or the easiest entry point, I should say, for somebody getting into gardening for the very first time. Yeah, I feel like that's a really um, good analogy to make because w with anything new that people are getting into, it's so easy to get overwhelmed with like the technicalities of everything. Yes. Like I have so many people who are like, like friends of mine who are trying to get into surfing or get into biking and they're like, oh, I think I need this board or and it's like, you just need a board. It's, it's yeah. like time in the water, you yeah, know, like you totally. just got to like, it just get out there with whatever you've got and like learn, like familiarize yeah. yourself with the, the area, you know, familiarize yourself with the concept of doing whatever it is. And then as you learn, you kind of like become more specialized and realize like, oh, I need this tool or like exactly this thing in order to do what I'm interested in doing at this exactly. point in my learning journey, you know? Yeah. And that's where like anytime that somebody is thinking about getting into gardening, there's, I, I think a lot of time there, there's this idea of like, oh, I want this big, huge bounty harvest yield, but the argument that I would actually make is your best serve starting really small, like with just one box like this, because it's less overwhelming. There's less that you have to figure out. It costs way less, right? If you had to put 10 boxes in all the soil around that, all the seeds that you're going to be growing, any of the structures that you'd be, you know, needing as well, watering well, irrigation. And the mental stress, like you, I feel like you're committing and then you're like, okay, I have to make this work because I've spent all totally. this. Like exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It changes things from being like, oh, this is something that I can go to and just be at peace with relaxing to all of a sudden it feels like a chore or it feels like an, like an investment that I need to like make money back on. And that completely changes the energy through which we enter into the garden. It goes from this place of, oh, I can't wait to spend an hour in my garden. And I wish it was a little bit bigger so I could spend two hours in my garden to now, dang, I got eight hours of gardening work that I need to get done. And I've only got three hours worth of time. So now, like, what am I going to prioritize? What am I not going to get to? And that's a completely different relationship to it. So starting small is probably one of the best things that a individual can do. And, and having that feeling, anytime that the feeling is like, oh, I wish I had a little bit of a bigger garden, that's like the right place to be. Because once you tip over that, it's like, oh, this is daunting. This is overwhelming. This is too much. This is stressful. And that's not how we want to be feeling when we're in the garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's quite a few barriers to entry in that. Like one of the biggest ones I find is just having space. Yeah. Um, especially today, like it's it's hard for people to find space, hard for people to find the time. But like especially like more urban people, like what would you what would your kind of advice be for people getting into it who yeah are uh, like renting and don't want to like invest a ton of money into totally like honestly I'd say it's, it's it's a blessing in disguise. It is a massive blessing in disguise because it effectively is forcing the hand of starting smaller, right? So if you're in a patio or if you're renting a house and you don't want to be making your investment into somebody else's yard or lawn, then you know you can slap together whether it's pieces of wood or you can like literally use like, you see those felt grow bags right behind there? You can be using something like that to be growing in all season long, and then you just move those to wherever it is that you're going to be living next. And so, and those like, are pretty durable. They'll help. Oh yeah, up. those are in their third season back there, and they're like totally perfect still. They, 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 the the plants in there look a little dead because they're garlic, and it's garlic season time right now. So they should <laughs> be looking dead, but um, that's that that's an indication of of the plant where it's at in its journey, not them being grow bags. Uh, and like yes, like my like my my girlfriend, she lives in an apartment, and she's got a, a patio there, and the amount of production that she gets from basically just like you know this one raised bed here four foot by eight foot is probably the size of the patio space uh and, and so she has to be able to walk through there as well but it has like lined the front lined the back with pots uh has a, one little small like raised little planter and things grow incredibly incredibly well there and it's again this like beautiful limitation because she would like to be doing more but 
she can't end up feeling overwhelmed because there just is not enough space for her to end up in that state of feeling overwhelmed or exhausted by the the garden that she has. So that's where I do really genuinely believe it is a blessing in disguise. And there's so many um, new, like not advancements necessarily, but like creative ideas that people can do to like grow vertically mm-hmm. in like small spaces mm-hmm. I've seen. And especially like condos, like the good thing about condos is that, you know, you're higher up. So you tend to get like a ton of really great exposure to sunlight. So yeah. if you have the means to... Totally grow a kind of vertical hanging thing well totally and then like just think about that if you are forced to maximize a a four foot by ten foot area and you have to think through okay i really want to grow these plants but i've only got this amount of space that means like i'm gonna have to put these plants six feet up so that they still get sun and they're not shaded up by these other plants. So the amount of problem solving that you're doing to understand like the fundamentals of gardening is way more than if you just had a huge field. It's like, I'm just gonna throw this there. I'm gonna throw this over here. I'm gonna throw that over there. It makes you like figure out way more. And then when you do have a larger space like this, you're effectively just like scaling those learnings that you've gained in that smaller environment. So once again, like, like, having a smaller space i view as a huge blessing in disguise when getting started on the gardening journey um tell me about i I watched a couple of your videos recently tell me about succession planting oh yes so succession planting. yeah yeah succession planting is so cool so the the concept of succession planting is that when you harvest a crop out you're able to plant a succession crop a crop that succeeds that one right and Especially with, within a growing season? With it, well, and that's exactly what I was going to yeah. say. Is, is like, especially for us in zone 7B, we're able to get like two really amazing crops out of the year. And so if you were to, uh, we can't quite see it right now, uh, but to say like take the potatoes at the at the far end there, that first... <laughs> Just get up and zoom in. Yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> that first row of uh, potatoes there, I planted those on May 1st. And I harvested my first round of them yesterday. And so if I wanted, I could have planted all of my potatoes then uh, and just like had them all being ready for right around now. However, what I did was I started the next crop June 1st. So that was like the first succession crop of them. And then the third crop I'll be starting like later today or tomorrow as my July planting of potatoes. And so now I've staggered my potatoes for different points through the season, but then those ones that I'm harvesting right now, now I've got space available again. So I could either put potatoes in there or I could plant something different, such as broccoli, cabbage, leafy leafy greens, arugula, uh, bush beans potentially, because that garden space is going to become available. The same thing goes with all this garlic. That's all getting pulled out next week. That's all going to be new square footage that I have available that I can be planting a succession crop into that's going to be ready as we get into October, like right towards the very end of the gardening season so on the far side of the bed which we aren't able to see right now i just started all of the seeds for those rather than waiting for them to come out of the garden i know that if i start them in a three inch seed cell i can leave them in there for about a month so i can start them a month earlier than when i'd be harvesting these out and now i've effectively like expanded my gardening season by an additional month and that's going to allow me to get like broccoli cabbage potentially even cauliflower out of the garden in the fall time yeah. So there's all these different ones that just come in sooner. And and just like potatoes, for example, does pulling them at different times of the year change the the structure and the flavor of these different plants? Yeah. So you could pull them on the earlier side, like while the plant is still green right now, and they'll be a little bit more tender. They'll be a little bit smaller. There won't be quite as many of them. Or you could like, you can literally leave potatoes in the ground all year round and they'll start growing back next year. Um, So I could leave those ones until those plants completely die back and they are not absorbing any more energy from the sun. And then at that point, harvest all those potatoes. They're gonna be a little bit bigger. Um, The the taste will still be like amazing on them. I'm not sure like what's changed compositionally within each of those potatoes. Um, And then I just pop those into storage for the fall and for the winter time. Yeah. Um, we talked a little bit before we were rolling about um, arugula and arugula bolting and stuff. Do you yeah. have any tips for people out there with like bolting plants and why does a plant bolt? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So like when you think about like the basically like the, the natural progression that a plant's going to go through, it's going to germinate, begin growing, 
put out foliage like leaves and then it's going to put out flowers for fruit um, or it's going to go directly to flower and seed so that'd be like a tomato is going to put out a tomato fruit versus an arugula doesn't have a fruit it's going to go straight into flower and into seed and so once a plant goes to flower or to seed it doesn't produce any more leaves it's basically at the end of its life because that's where it's putting its energy exactly exactly and there's a good number of plants that just don't love tons of heat such as broccoli arugula spinach etc and so what they do is that when it gets really hot they're like this is too much for me i'm done and that's when they bolt, they go to flower, they go to seed, the plant is done producing for you. So there's you know probably two primary things that you would be looking to do to expand that time with them. Um, first one would be like not planting them so that they're hitting maturity at the peak of summer. So arugula is really great early in the season and late in the season. So you could start, like I'll probably start another round of arugula in mid-July or late July because um, it's going to take a couple of weeks for it to get going and growing. And then as temperatures start to cool in September, October, it's hitting maturity. I've got really great arugula to then be enjoying. Um, and then the second thing that you can be doing is that as the plant bolts and goes to flower, is that if you basically like just chop the plant two inches from uh, the soil level, so you're cutting the vast majority of it off, it's going to put out another round of uh, leaves because it has to first develop a canopy before it puts out its next round of flowers. So you'd be able to like essentially extend the season as it starts getting into those really stressful hot environments. And uh, those the, the the longer that you leave those leaves and, and the, the more that you cut it back, the kind of like spicier the leaves get. So like the garlic, or sorry, the, the uh, arugula that's coming out of the garden right now, it's like very, very spicy because we're pretty much in like yeah, the peak of summertime. That's the good stuff. That's the good stuff. Yeah, that's that, that stuff is super, super nice. I'm all for it. Um, so yeah, for like, it's funny because like for myself, I actually don't even grow broccoli in the spring towards summertime. I start all of my broccoli now basically July 1st and then plant it where the garlic is right now and it's going to hit maturity and head up into a nice head of broccoli for like right around October. I harvest that out, I pull those plants out and I put my garlic cloves back in to begin their growing process because they take about nine months to grow. And so that bed is like producing for me year round um and i just have to be a little bit creative with how i go about it by starting the broccoli in seed cells so they get that extra kind of like 30 days of growing before the garlic is out of that bed and are there like different species of plants that um that you work with that like in a regenerative manner where it's like you know one is going to fix the soil in a certain way than the one that follows is that kind of like the three sisters what yeah corn, beans and... yeah that's that's one of the experiments yeah. that i want to do this year is basically like planting legumes so i'm going to do a soil analysis first I'm going to plant a uh, cover crop of legumes they're meant to fix nitrogen in the soil and so i want to then do a soil analysis once that plant has grown to see what has basically changed from the beginning of planting to the end of planting and outside of that like i, I haven't done tons from a yeah like you know kind of like the, the 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 cover cropping or utilizing the plants to amend the soil um i lean far more into compost and warm castings and the reason behind that is just again i think that this chapter that i'm in right now is one of what's the first time gardener needing what what would make their life easiest and my perspective on that is that you know utilizing compost worm castings an organic fertilizer is an easier path in than doing a soil analysis figuring which cover crop should be going in there getting that cover crop started at the right time so it grows to maturity and then can be cut back and then like mulching or, or, or burying that into the soil that's just like a more intensive kind of starting point and it's one where i'm curious about it and that's why i'm going to do an experiment on it this year but it's also one where i the, the, the there's yeah just more like teaching and educating at that like gardening 101 level that i want to be doing um for gardeners before then beginning to layer that stuff in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's just where you are in your journey yeah absolutely i don't know i i, I love anytime that I get messages from people about how they've started gardening or how much they're loving their first season of gardening, 
uh, that's like that. That's the juice for me. Like I, I love those conversations, those moments, those messages so much. And so that's where, yeah, that's where I've enjoyed spending like the majority of my time. And it's really neat because that's that's not me, right? Like I love learning about what's happening in the soil biology. And so like the accounts that I follow, uh, like this one lady, Ashley, she's gardening in Canada and she's a soil scientist and she goes so technical on her content. And for anybody that I talk to, that'd be so overwhelming. But for me, I'm just like, oh yeah, this is the good stuff. Yeah. Like fill <laughs> yeah. me in on it. So she actually helped me with this experiment here. And uh, yeah, this, the, the, it's, you know, th those individuals that are you know kind of doing the gardening 301 or the gardening 401 content that I tune into to listen for my learning and my educating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what's the most gratifying part about this whole project for you? Is that it? The f hearing from people? Uh, I think, uh, honestly, I, I think it's twofold. Um, one part is 100% that. Like, getting these messages, having these conversations, hearing from people that they've kind of fallen in love with gardening in a way similar to me is, like, I wouldn't change that. I wouldn't trade that for the world. And then honestly, I think like a, another part of it is just like the, like my personal journey of, can I do this? And, and just like that, it, it, it's, I think it's a little bit of like a self love journey of like, I believe that I have the potential to build and create mine and so on something amazing. Um, and I don't fully love myself until I, accomplish that and and i'm starting to now feel like it's it's at this place where i'm like damn this is really cool what i've built and brought into the world here and um when i look at the size of it now and you know that is at six hundred thousand people that are getting a lot of value from this um that that, that voice isn't so loud in my head of like uh, again like you, you kind of like you're, you're not worthy until you've done this or, or, or created this and so that's that's the journey that i'm on internally and and that's been really challenging at points throughout because there have been moments where it's been really tough financially and i think in some ways i was using that as a measure of success uh, for whether or not i'm successful or good at this and and so i, I there have been moments where i felt very trapped where i'm like I don't want to be working on anything else, but this also isn't viable yet, and therefore I suck. Um, when in reality, like it's just needed more time, and and now I'm getting to a place where things are becoming viable. Things are having an amazing, massive impact from from my perspective. Um, that I feel in like a really peaceful place on that front, um, and so that's uh, yeah, I, I'd say that's a very gratifying part of this experience for me personally as well um would you say that this journey like do you feel it like changing your approach in any ways like do you feel like obligated to do things that you wouldn't necessarily do like has it become a job in any way we're like oh i guess i'll pull this garlic right now if you want to do that like <laughs> it the, the, i mean there's there's definitely elements of it being a job or, or i'd say like being work right like like scripting content for like how i'm going to go about discussing a particular topic that feels like work and then as soon as i'm out here creating it it feels more much more like play the biggest thing that i'd say has like shifted or or changed is that like i don't view the success of mind and soil based off of what it does financially um I'm far more motivated by the number of people that I can reach um, and kind of helping to get it out to as many people as possible. And it's been really, really nice letting that weight go. Um, and I, I don't know, I, th I think that culturally there's been a lot of, you know, like how much money have you raised? How much money can you make? How much did you sell the company for? Money, money, money. And for me, I'm like, that's, probably the part of things that like makes me most like anxious and stressed out like the part that i love is just like creating really dope content and like getting that out to as many people as possible and so like why am i using this other measuring stick that doesn't light me up for whether or not i'm successful and so that's been like probably the area that's shifted the most is that and, and I, I had kind of like this epiphany earlier this year that like i I identify less as an entrepreneur now and I identify much more as just a creator where like the 
the business side keeps the lights on and and is is growing and all that but like i just want to be creating as much stuff as possible right where an entrepreneur is focused on like business in a yeah. sense yeah. yeah 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 like i i could see myself at some point in time almost like hiring a ceo or hiring like a coo like somebody to just handle like the operational side of like we've got a massive and amazing audience and there's value that we can be bringing to this audience that will allow us to create even more content but the thing that I want to be doing is creating that content. So somebody else can like handle that piece to it. Um, and I think that's a really good decision if that allows me to be spending even more time creating content and like doing the gardening 401 experiment on like getting soil sample from each of these beds under the microscope and then trying to like figure out, okay, like from a compost and a biology perspective, what should we be adding into these beds to give them the best likelihood of succeeding? That's the type of stuff that I want to be like nerding out at and geeking out on totally. that. That came very, very yeah, naturally yeah, yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, um, yeah, it's a it's a good mentality to have, mm -hmm. um, for sure. I think like so many people get stuck into that that kind of capitalism mindset where it's like all about how much money you're making in order to be successful. But again, like you got to have passion and love for not necessarily what you do to make money. Like that's like the dream is if you can like like you said the Ica guy like making money from something that gives back to the world and like mm -hmm. that sustains you. Like that's amazing. But for most people out there and people listening, like, I don't think it even has to be that. Like, you can have a job that you're maybe not totally into, but, like, as long as you have something outside of that that you're, like, that you love to do, that you're passionate about, that, like, drives you and motivates you, so you have something to, like, spend those paychecks on where you're, like, looking forward to it, you yeah. know? Like, totally. I think that's 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 so huge. Like, we need to, as a society, put more emphasis on people doing things that they love and, and enabling that, you know? A hundred percent. And the probably biggest inspiration that i have is mark rober are you familiar with him he's so he he's a creator really popular i'm not sure if you ever saw like the squirrel maze in the backyard videos but he created <laughs> no these. it sounds fun though. yeah yeah he, he, he's amazing <laughs> and what's super interesting about him right he's he's now got like 23 or 25 million subscribers to his youtube channel has built an amazing business crunch labs on helping kids get into engineering and he was an engineer at nasa and he started building his youtube channel while he was still at nasa and for him uh, the YouTube channel, there was no financial pressure. It was just like his outlet, the thing that he did that he loved. He loved creating videos. He loved teaching people about physics, specifically kids. And because he had no financial pressure, he was able to just build it however he felt and however he wanted to. And I think that kept it really, really like pure. And he didn't leave you know, kind of like the, the corporate world until he was at 10 million subscribers to his channel. Um, and at that point, his channel and, and his kind of like social following was paying him far more than what he was making at NASA. That's insane. Yeah, totally. Oh my God. And, and so it, it's just like this whole notion of kind of like reducing financial pressure so that the purity of what you're looking to create remains and that was something that i felt a lot last year was that when i was in that like that physical products chapter i was like oh, i need to like a another product for this time of year so we can have more revenue at this point because otherwise it's a really slow period just because gardening seasonal but then it's like i'm starting to like reach for straws on like i don't believe in this product i don't believe that in this model of like needing to sell something at this time like we should just be resting in november just as nature's resting and getting ready for the season ahead and so it was just like letting go of some of that and kind of decreasing that financial pressure so that i could build it in the way that felt most pure and most real to me yeah I yeah, it's just such a trap sometimes. Like, it's so hard for people, yeah, trap, like, in that kind of the rat race of things, like, to even get a leg up when you can focus on, like, doing your passions. And I think that's kind of, like, the one biggest fallacy of this kind of system that we've created is we've so normalize the the 40 hour work week and overtime and like you grind and you give your your time away to the man to make like and maybe you get like a bonus and a raise it's like we're like so willingly victims to this society that like disempowers us when like 
you know, then we have no time to like spend with friends and family first and foremost. But then like the little bit of free time we do have, we're so overwhelmed from our jobs and mm-hmm. everything that we tune out watching Netflix and scrolling Instagram and doing all that. And I realized this as, you know, a creator of myself, like it's a catch 22. Cause it's like, I'm, you know, similar to you. It's like trying to get people inspired and engaged when they spend their time on, on Instagram. Yeah. Like I always feel like if I'm doing my job right, I'm putting myself out of business. Like, yeah, yeah. I want people to not be on social media in the first place because they're so enamored and lo- in love with where they are. Yeah. But like you have to hook them there because that's where everybody is. Totally. Totally. Like totally. I, I love when I like go through, I'll go through messages and like, and suddenly there's just like, um, what is it? What is it? When someone deletes their account, deletes, you know, it's yeah, just yeah, like yeah, Instagram yeah, subscriber yeah, totally, and totally. Like, there's no face. Like, I don't like, know who this person <laughs> was, but they're out of the system. Yeah, yeah. You're like, feels like you're breaking free of the matrix. Like, yeah, I love yeah, that. Yeah, to- totally. Yeah. And like, I, you know, like I felt so much of that, like, uh, corporate side, even as I was starting mind and soil, where I was like, I gotta be working every minute of every day. And then, you know, the whole gardening season has gone by and you haven't actually enjoyed the garden at all. And you're like, dang, wait, why, why am I doing this? Why am I building this? So it's been like a few years of, you just kind of like trial and error with that. We'll try out trial and error and, and retraining or reprogramming my brain for like, again, like what I've been patterned or told is successful versus what I actually feel is the definition of success. Exactly. In, in, in my mind and in, and in my books. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Do you have a favorite plant? I'm I'm a huge fan of garlic um and it's probably I'd say it's one of the best beginner gardening crops so I'm very very partial to garlic and it's in the ground you know for 9 months so You've got a lot of it. Yeah, there's like 200 <laughs> 200 uh cloves that I planted that will become 200 heads. We'll we'll excuse me, we'll, we'll harvest one for you before you before you head out here. <laughs> nice. Um, asparagus this is the first year that i've had my asparagus growing because it takes a couple years to establish but being able to like just go out into the garden like crack an asparagus spear off and then two days later there's a new one that's shot right back up from that same crown does it, it does it regenerate that quick yeah it's like, like oh, you can be harvesting that. a couple of days but yeah one asparagus plant it produces one asparagus no, no so it's a an asparagus crown and there'll be multiple spears that come off of oh, that crown okay cool yeah yeah so w- w- when we go over there and take a look you'll see like there's like three or four ones that have been cracked off and then i've left the fronds grow for them just to be absorbing the sun's energy now and then tomatoes are like a classic just fan favorite to be enjoying both like through all through the summer as sandwiches like, like kind of like you know just sliced onto a sandwich with some mozzarella and some balsamic vinegar some olive oil and then you know canned and preserved all that type of stuff as yeah. well so. tomatoes are great it's they're really hard to grow on the island we don't have the uh, the sun, sun and the dry heat yeah. um, i have a friend who lives down in, in new mexico and her family her dad is like a chili farmer Mm. and um i love mexican food yeah i love tomatillos it's like my oh that's like my love language yeah. is like fresh tomatillo <laughs> salsa um and i was talking with her and she's like oh yeah like we pulled tomatillos like weeds like they just grow crazy yeah. here and i'm just like so like yeah i want that <laughs> oh and it's like i i like when i have had a garden here in the school i like i've worked so hard to grow a tomatillo like i think i had like two tomatillo plants i got like maybe a dozen yeah, yeah. And, and they were tiny yeah and it was just it was like the bane of my existence and to hear that they're growing so well down that she pulls them like weeds i'm just like so frustrated totally, <laughs> so totally. Heartbroken. yeah totally yeah i like honestly i with with being this close to the chief and with the, all the trees around my place it's a very challenging growing environment for me. There, there've been a couple people that are like, I'm actually like really impressed with what you get out of your garden based on where you are. And I was like, I feel so seen by that because I'm like, this is not an easy environment just with yeah. like, cause like that, that sun's just going to get lower and lower. And then it like, you know, it starts dipping behind the mountains and doesn't get any sun through like the late fall into like the early spring. So as soon as I end up on a homestead somewhere at some point in time, I feel like things are going to just like massively get unlocked for me because I've been learning so much, doing so much experimentation in a challenging growing environment. And so once I'm in a favorable growing environment and able to apply all those learnings, I'm like, I'm super that's stoked for what next that's level. Be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, are you, are you much of a cook? I, uh, so I absolutely love cooking. Uh, it's right now it's kind of more just like a time thing. So like how i I, i'd say that like right now i love cooking like one really good meal per week uh and then i'll like do a big prep session on something else and 
yeah, just uh, kind of power through that over over the course of the week. But I uh, yeah, absolutely love cooking, and it's another one of those areas I just kind of like lose myself in at this point because I'm very comfortable with just seeing what I have in the kitchen, being able to put something really tasty together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just didn't. I mean, if you're into gardening and, and harvesting, like everything. Uh, that's like a great way to like reap the rewards of everything yeah. that you're doing, you know? Yeah. Like I, um, I, I love doing like garden goodie dinners and last night we had like our first one of the season. And so yesterday we harvested zucchinis, beans, uh, potatoes. Potatoes are another such a fun crop just to like harvest. Cause you don't know like what's beneath the surface and you're like digging for gold type of feeling, uh, kale, arugula, blueberries, strawberries, nasturtium flowers mm, there might nasturtium have been flowers so, so underrated just, yeah totally yeah. and just turned that into like a huge uh yeah basically garden goodies dinner and then like i i do eat meat myself and increasingly kind of moving towards only eating meat where i know the farm that it's came from or capturing it myself so i went fishing in tofino a couple of weeks back and so now like the only fish that i eat is in my freezer and so being able to like enjoy that in the meal as well uh for me is really but like literally everything that we ate last night was harvested and forged by by myself which was really neat yeah that's awesome love that mentality Mm -hmm. um is there anything else we haven't talked about that you want to mention any closing remarks no, I think I honestly I think that's that that's everything. Uh, I I just reiterate that you know gardening definitely gives you amazing fruits and vegetables and flowers and that like pales in comparison to how good it feels when you're in the garden. Like that's the that's the greatest gift that it can like that, that it can give to anybody. Yeah. Yeah, my um my dad isn't much of a food gardener, but he's like so huge into landscaping mm. and we haven't like really talked about this he and I, but it, like I see him and it's like that's his meditation, that's yeah. his zen. He comes home from work and he goes in the garden, and he's yeah. there till sun goes down and he's Totally. He's in his 70s now and he's still just like chucking wheelbarrows and dirt around and you're like, what are you doing? Totally. But he loves it. And yeah. He's just got all these exotic, he's got plants from Tasmania and stuff, just getting them growing up in this climate and he's so proud. Like oh, He's got a couple of palm trees and he's like, he was the first one kind of in his area to do palms and he's like so proud of them. They're like 30 feet tall and yeah. he's like, no one thought you could do it, but here it is. Yeah. <laughs> totally. It's really funny. Yeah. My, my, my parents are the same way. They, they've they got a massive garden and... Uh, like that, I think that the things that they argue and bicker and banter about the most are like what pickling recipe to be going with and stuff like that. So I'm like, that's the kind of relationship problems that I want to have. Right. <laughs> that's funny. Um, where can people find you and learn more about all that you do? Where can they see your stuff? Yeah. So basically just mind, M-I-N-D and A-N-D soil, S-O-I-L on any of the big platforms, YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram, mind soil on all three of those. And then, yeah, those, you know, going to be lots of short form video on those three platforms and then long form videos on YouTube. Those are the, the, the places that, that you can find me. Killer. Um, mm-hmm. As part of this podcast thing, I, I do a donation for everybody, a donation to a nonprofit of my guest choosing. I didn't preempt you this, so I don't oh, know. Yeah. You haven't had a chance to think about it. I haven't had a chance to think but, about um, it. But do you have anybody that comes to mind who you'd like to give a, a donation to as a thank you for your time here to support some sort of local you know, business nonprofit um, thing? What, what what I yeah what what I'll, what I'll go with on that front because um, West Coast Seeds has been really really supportive of me with this journey the last couple of years and and they do a lot of work with Food Banks Canada and uh, so so why don't we go with with that just kind of to, to support the two of them who Food Banks Food, Food Banks Canada yeah yeah sure but, but yeah just because I I really appreciate um, everything that that West Coast Seeds has done to help me and I know that they've got a, a nice relationship with Food Banks Canada yeah and you mentioned not necessarily food bank related but like you do a lot when you have surplus garden stuff you'll kind of give it to the neighborhood when it's too much for you to consume totally yeah, yeah. like I'll I'll just leave a little basket on my front steps um and then i'll pop a facebook message into my facebook group for or sorry the, the facebook group for this neighborhood uh and just let you know whoever wants to grab some zucchinis or cucumbers tomatoes basil so on and so forth to come and just just grab that and and then yeah like as all the flowers start happening i like one of my favorite things to do is i'll just like put bouquets together and i'll just drop them off on random doorsteps with like a little note like have a great day um not like any like sign from jordan at mine and soul or anything like that but just like a random bouquet on a doorstep just to yeah you know kind of spread that joy of of gardening to whomever receives it i, I literally have no i literally have no idea who who receives them but i 
have too many flowers and yeah, like to like to share that joy. You sound like your your neighbor's favorite neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I hope so, but um, who knows? I'm, I'm back here with like multiple cameras and talking to a camera for <laughs> many hours. So <laughs> I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I think they're fans though. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm. Um, well, thanks so much for spending the time yeah. and sharing your garden with me. It's been rad. Oh, thanks so much for, for having me. Awesome. Yeah, getting to chat about all this and obviously a huge fan. So this is yeah. really cool. Likewise, man. Thanks awesome. so much. Appreciate it. So Jordan actually gave me a couple bulbs of his prized garlic from his front yard after we recorded that conversation, and I've still got them drying in my kitchen. I cannot wait to crack into them, you know, truly grown with love. It's going to be great. So you can follow Jordan and learn more about his project on Instagram and YouTube at Mind and Soil, or pick up some warm castings at mindandsoil.com. I'll also throw a couple links to the studies we referenced in today's episode below in the show notes, as well as information on Food Banks Canada, whom Jordan has decided to send this episode's donation to. Now, every episode, I make a donation to a nonprofit of the guest choosing thanks to support from folks like yourself on Patreon, as well as from sponsors of this project like Hoka and their sweets, the sandly minded kicks I mentioned earlier, the Anna Kappa 2 hiking shoe. Again, great fit and feel if you're in the market for some new boots to keep you comfortable and on the move in the outdoors, but only if you truly need them. Now, if you're enjoying this podcast and all the fun educational videos I make on social media, you can help support their production by becoming a Patreon supporter for as little as a dollar a month or more at patreon.com slash nerdyaboutnature, or you can make a one-time donation at nerdyaboutnature.com. I've also got some really sweet organic cotton shirts and merch out there you can check out, and all of this support goes into giving me the stability to continue putting the time, energy, resources, and research into all these various topics to continue making this content that aims to educate, inspire, and shape a new future for tomorrow. So if you're enjoying it, and if you're able to, then I would really appreciate your support so I can keep on doing it. Either way, I'm absolutely stoked that you're all here engaging and learning. So thank you so much for tuning into this episode, and I hope to catch you next time.